Okay, I should really uh, get you up and doing some calisthenics or something after two long days of this sort of thing. Um, okay, so I'm a behavioural ecologist, so we're actually going to talk about fishes and we're going to talk about what animals do, how they interact with their environment. Now, the last couple of days we've heard that coral reefs are in crisis and we've heard that corals are actually not quite on the way out, but looking pretty bad. When that happens, we get this major change in fish communities. And although we've got lots of um, theories about why that happens, we don't actually have that much data about the patterns and processes and the mechanisms that underlie what on earth goes on. So what we've been doing for the last probably 10 years is my lab's been sort of burrowing into how animals survive on degraded habitats. And I think hopefully what you find is, well, what, what I've found today is actually quite interesting and you'll find interesting too. Lots of people were involved of this, in this. This was some of them, you know, um, and lots and lots, of course, of very keen volunteers, very keen to go out and uh, play underwater. I want to draw your attention particularly to Doug Shivers and Mo Ferrari from the University of Saskatchewan, who've uh, contributed quite markedly to some of the concepts involved. We've seen in the last couple of days, coral reefs are in crisis. And um, we've, we've discussed quite a few uh, um, examples of the drivers of that crisis and the drivers, drivers of, of coral uh, degradation and loss. And uh, Terry has some very good examples of some massive data sets many of you contributed to on the importance of coral bleaching in particular. Of course, when this happens, we have a number of documented cases where we get major changes in the fish communities. And here's one here from the Ames Monitoring Data Set, data set Alice Shields paper from this year in GCB, where two, um, two um, cyclones came over the, the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef, and this is their comparison to the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. You can sort of just see up there. Uh, cyclone uh, Hamish and Yassi. And um, they, they caused, on the reefs that they were monitoring, a 68% loss in coral and got a dramatic change in the fish community that was there. We've got some species that did really well, it's shown in green on, our far, on your far left. Some didn't do quite so well. And really what we're really interested here is what the processes are and what the mechanisms underlying those processes are driving that change. What on earth goes on? Sometimes it happens very, very quickly, and uh, sometimes even quicker than you know, we can get out there and, and monitor. And of course, some of the things that are going to instigate that change are really bleedingly obvious. Over it's sort of really um, scales in terms of years, we get reductions in topographic complexity, and with that, we get a loss of shelter sites for animals. We also get a loss in the biodiversity of the actual benthos itself, and that leads to a loss of, of course, the number of fundamental ecological niches you can fit into a unit area of coral reef. Some fishes die and some fishes thrive, and we want to know why that is. And our research has been really focusing in on how predator-prey interactions and the dynamics between predators and prey might change as that coral reef degrades. To understand this process, we've really got to understand how animals, vertebrates, actually behave and what the drivers, principal drivers of that behaviour are. And of course, some of those drivers that, involve, that really um, limit the extent to which these animals, you know, what they can actually do, what they can, how they can behave, are a number of what we might call templates. And we can think of those as developmental, physiological, or behavioural templates. And on top of those, we have superimposed the current state of affairs for a particular individual. And this might be driven by its prior experience in behaviour, its feeding history, its body condition, or maybe its recent stress history. Now, that's going to influence its behavioural trade-offs. And one of the behavioural trade-offs it has is this one here. So they've got a trade-off between vigilance and other fitness-promoting activities like foraging, like maintenance, and all those things that accumulate energy and storage and are important for growth and for reproduction. And so when you actually get a change in this sort of trade-off, um, what, we, what we have is a change in how much energy they have to put into growth and reproduction which is an important non, uh, um, uh, indirect effect. Of course, vigilance, all the, uh, vigilance is getting balanced to get all, against all of those other things. And if you get vigilance wrong, then either you're dead 
or you have a, an inappropriate um, allocation of energy to gross and reproduction. I've got friends. I've got friends. <laughs> Last talk of the day. You've got to have comedy, guys. <laughs> okay. So we have, we have a system where we have vigilance. The key for those animals is trying to work out who to actually avoid, who's, who actually represents a threat. So learning about predators and being able to catalogue predators is critically important, particularly as animals move um, into a particular habitat or between habitats where those, um, those um, predators might actually change. So how on earth do they actually learn about threats? They have a very good system of actually learning who to avoid so they can tailor their behaviour to the habitat that they live within. So basically there's three main... You've got a history lesson here. There are three main ways in which they can actually learn about um, who to avoid. They can, of course directly um, experience a predation event. And most, pred most predators are actually really poor at what they do and they have really low strike success. So that's a possible mechanism that they can use. A little bit dangerous, though. A much better mechanism to use is an indirect way of actually learning about predators. They can do this. One key component is what's called a chemical alarm cue. We've got a Lujanus bohar up there, a yeah, big snapper racing in. It's going to grab one of, the, one of those Ambon damselfishes, either rip it apart or it's going to damage it and the ambon damselfish is going to limp away. Whatever happens, it's going to disrupt the cells of the, of the surface of that little fish. And when it does that, it releases some chemicals, which in ludicrously small amounts, they're called chemical alarm cues, ludicrously small amounts will, will um, be detected by the fishes downstream and if it's conspecific, it will react with an innate anti-predator response involving retreat to shelter, basically. It's, it's scared. These, are really, these chemical alarm odours are really quite important because when they're linked at the same time with a novel predator odour or of a sight of a predator, that novel thing becomes, becomes listed as a threat. Okay, they only need to do that once and they can remember that for at least three weeks. Yeah? So fishes aren't actually that dumb. Okay. Um, so it's a really important way for them to actually uh, um, uh, detect risk spatially and temporally, yeah, those chemical alarm odours. And the third way of actually learning about who predators are and those predator threats is, of course, public information, learning from somebody else that's actually already learned. But that's problem, uh, pro problematic because the reliability of that information is unknown. So some individuals might be cheating, and that could actually be dangerous. So you might actually end up dying. So they don't actually end up using very much public information. So in really in the last 10 years, we found that these animals have a very sophisticated way of actually learning about predators and who to avoid. This is particularly important at life history bottlenecks, such as settlement, when these little fishes are coming in from the larval phase and what they use is these odours that are coming off the reef, particularly chemical alarm cues, to actually assess the risk of the habitat that they're coming into. When they actually do that, and, when they were, and we found recently, when they do that and they determine that it's actually a risky habitat, they develop what's called a neophobic phenotype. This is a phenotype that becomes more lateralised, has more effective uh, escape response, it recovers faster from stress, and it has, when we put them in the field and we've trained them to be neophobic, we find that they have higher survival in the field. So being able to judge, to judge risk from those chemical alarm cues is critically important, and it's really important for survival. So they have a ludicrously flexible and sophisticated way of learning stuff, particularly about threats. But it's context-specific, yeah? It's habitat-specific. So what happens as a system changes from coral-dominated to more rubbly-dominated thing, as we see here? Obviously, the visual barriers are changing, but you can imagine that if you had the ability to go down and smell what was going on, it really stinks. Yeah, so those of you that have dragged a bit of dead coral out from the reef and actually left it anywhere, soon your, your colleagues start complaining. 
yeah? And that was one reason why we started looking at this, because this stuff really stinks. Okay, so the, we had a really quite a major modification to the olfactory landscape that all these, this chemical information has to go through before it gets to these animals. Important. Okay, so we're going to focus now, and some of our research has been focusing now on the, the modification of those, the chemical environment and how the chemical cues in the environment might actually be modified by, you know, the, 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 um, the basal smells that come from the degraded environment. And to do that, one of the first things that we did is ask whether dead degraded coral affected the utility of chemical alarm cues because they're so important. To do that, we've set up this assay. We've got a little fish that's been acclimated in a tank. We can record its behavior. It swims around, it bites, it chews, um, and, and it uses shelter. Okay, we can add cues to that and see how it responds to those cues. So we can add salt water, we can add chemical alarm cues, and we can add controls for damage release cells from distant, the different, uh, distant phylogenetic organisms. And in this particular case, for our focal damselfish, we're using apigonid smells. And we can do that under two water sources. We can use water that's trickled past dead, degraded coral. We can use water that's trickled past live coral. So we can change the background of cues that is going to try and detect risk within. Okay, and let's see. Okay, so our expectation, we in inject a chemical alarm cue. We would expect it to retreat to shelter and feed less. Yeah, typical sort of thing that you would expect from any sort of organism. They're upregulating vigilance. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Okay, so these are, so we've got change in bite rate on our y-axis. Um, two water sources, live and dead there. Um, uh, that's coming from the header tank, and we've got cues that we're injecting into the tanks. So we can see the results there from our controls, very little change in their foraging response. However, when we add the chemical alarm cue, when the water source is actually from, if it's been trickled over live coral, we find that there's a really quite a marked anti-predator response to the chemical alarm cue, as we might expect. Hey, you know, we've seen that before. But when we did it even in the dead coral water, we were really surprised, and we thought we got it wrong, because they didn't respond to that honest indicator of risk. You couldn't get a more honest indicator of risk. It comes from a conspecific just next to you that's just been gobbled up. Okay, so it seems as though something about that dead degraded coral was influencing the utility of that chemical alarm cue and influenced the innate, the innate response, the anti-predator response that we got. And when we placed these individuals, uh, newly settled individuals, onto coral heads that were alive or dead, uh, similar sort of topographic complexity, of course we find and monitor them over time, we find that the ones on live coral survive better than the ones on dead coral. So we wanted to know next how broad that problem was. Yeah, so we looked at it, we've looked at it in 12 different species, quite a few damselfishes, but there's a few apigonids in there, and believe it or not, there's even a dart fish thrown in there, which was misidentified by somebody. Um, so, hey, we'll take what we get. Okay, so we, but we've got them sitting on a scale between ones that really like to use live coral to ones that actually really like to use rubble. Yeah, and we were interested to see whether those cues from the dead degraded coral would actually influence their alarm cue response. So let's see what we actually found. So here's for six um, damselfishes, ranging from live coral associates, chromis, right down to the blue damselfish there at the, the, the far left, and Phomocentris nagasakiensis. Um, and we can see in live coral they have a very well-developed um, anti-predator um, response. They reduce the amount of foraging they do to a chemical alarm cue. What happens when we do it in the dead degraded coral? Okay, for three of those species, lo and behold, we don't get a significant anti-predator response. For the other three, we do get an anti-predator response. So it seems as though for the ones that are more closely aligned to live coral, we seem to have that real problem that it knocks out the utility of their chemical alarm cue response. Another five species. In the middle there, we've got Pomacent, the Ambon damselfish again, literally as a litmus test to make sure that this is working. This is, this is a study done by an honor student recently, um, Randall Barry. And once again, we can see a very well-developed alarm cue response in um, live coral water. When we add dead coral water, though, in three species, we, do know, we don't any longer have a significant response. 
compared to um, the saltwater controls. But in two species, we still actually have a very, very well-developed um, anti-predator response. So overall, we find that of the 12 species that we've tested today, seven of them, seven of them seem to be affected by dead degraded water. They no longer have that uh, alarm cue response. How bad can it be? Well, sadly for us, we've gone out and we've gone into the field and we've done lots of experiments. We found out every part of its ecology that we can think of that seems to involve chemical alarm cues is sadly affected. Yeah? So it, they cannot learn from associative learning anymore. They do not develop neophobic or neophobia or neophobic response, and they do not seem to be able to get out of jail through ontogeny. So if we do it on sub-adults, they still have that same problem, even if we drag them and they've been surviving in dead degraded coral. Yeah? So sadly, they don't seem to be able to find a way out of that. What's the spatial and temporal scale of these sorts of problems? Well, we've looked at that too, and we've gone to... Um, um, areas of the reef where we have banks of coral that are sort of jutting out from the reef onto the sand, and we've got a unidirectional flow of water um, um, over the top of that coral. We've put live coral at different distances on the sand away from that rubble bank, and when we've assessed the anti-predator response to the chemical alarm cue of fishes that have been acclimated to those little patches of reef, what we find is that it's actually a relatively small spatial scale. Okay, so it seems to be a threshold effect. If it's less than two metres, they they, that, that uh, dead degraded water seems to affect the alarm cue response. If it's more than two metres, then they seem to have a really well-developed anti-predator response to the chemical alarm cue. So it seems to be on a relatively small spatial scale. What about the temporal scale? Well, it seems to be relatively small as well. We tested fish on dead degraded coral. We didn't have a chemical alarm cue response. When we moved exactly the same fish to live coral, left them for 20 to 40 minutes to acclimate and tested them again, lo and behold, they had a well-developed alarm cue response. So it seems to be relatively small scale. Now, this means that local hydrology is going to be really important, so probably tidal flushing, and also the spatial patterns in the substrate that's in the vicinity that they live. So that's going to be important too. What's causing, lastly, what's causing the effect? Okay, so we've done experiments on this whole stack of them. It seems to be chemical modification of a complex, um, the complex um, alarm odor molecule rather than an alteration of the receptor sheet within the uh, olfactory naris. It seems to be the plant components of the benthos that are causing this, particularly cyanobacteria um, and um, blooming diatoms. Yeah, on dead degraded uh, coral. But there's some plants that still seem to be doing it that you would normally find on a healthy reef, like the red um, algae Galaxaria, seems to actually really be quite potent as well. So it's possibly a broader um, problem than we might have actually expected. So in summary, it seems as though the fishes that are really associated with live coral that are most affected, but there's other fishes that are affected too that seem to, you know, flip between live and dead coral. They seem to be unable to use their alarm cues and everything else associated with alarm cue, and, and, and that's going to influence their ecology and their potential to survive. It modifies the structure of the alarm odor molecule, and it doesn't seem to influence the olfactory naris of the fish itself. It's on small spatial and temporal scales, which mean that local dynamics and hydrodynamics are going to be critically important to it. And it's produced by active components of the benthic substrate. So what are we going to do next? Well, three-pronged approach, really. We're going to look at how broad, taxonomically broad, the effect is. We're going to be looking at a more of an ecotoxicological uh, approach. And we're going to be saying, hey, what's the chemistry associated with this? And what sort of uh, chemicals are associated? Uh, and, and what sort of concentrations are they biologically active in? And then, of course, most importantly, we're going to be looking at the capacity of these fishes that are affected to potentially adapt and acclimate to the problem. Okay. Thanks very much, guys.